Well, thank you, Roger. Uh, I might have more uh, theological education than Roger does, but the worth of the car is on how, how long it's been on the road, not in the mechanic shop, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm sure uh, there's so much uh, for me to learn from Roger, and actually I've been learning so much. So thank you once again. Uh, it's great to be here, uh, at least on this end. I've been like moving from opposites, like end to end. Uh, well, I'll share a little bit about my story, just a little bit. Uh, you can wait till the movie comes out, OK? <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Ben. And uh, I was born, actually, people always say, is your name really Ben? <laughs> Benjamin, yes. Uh, Benjamin Haskin Davis Ahayam. You know, when I give it to people, they want to put it on their phones. They'll say, no, you'll run out of memory space. So just stick with Ben. So. My name's Ben. I was born in India in, the, in a southern city called Chennai. It used to be called Madras. Uh, for people from the church, I always say a point of reference is that's where St. Thomas was killed, martyred, right? Uh, it's kind of a funny feeling because I'm not bragging about St. Thomas being killed in my city, but it's just to say that uh, we have almost Christianity from its founder and on. So there's a long history of uh, the Christian faith in India, uh, though it's really, in some ways, it's deep, but it's not spread out as well. Uh, so that's where I am from. I was born in a Christian family, um, very uh, you know, religious in some sense. But then, uh, in high school, I had to consciously make uh, you know, a decision to follow Christ. And then, you know, like every other Indian kid, I worked in IT. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in my previous church, you know, uh, people always call. And, you know, uh, uh, this was in California. I'll, I'm just jumping a few years. Uh, so OK, uh, you know, they'll call the church. And they'll never find me at my desk. Because I'm always, like, every 30 minutes, I get up and walk around. And then people are like, Ben, why don't you pick up your phone? And just to play a joke on them, I'll tell them, you know what? I don't want to talk to these people, because they might think you outsourced your customer support to India. <laughs> anyway, that's I, I'm never at my desk. That's the truth. So, <laughs> so anyway, so uh, worked in IT. In, uh, in 2008, there was this feeling of, you know, uh, this is not what I want to do. Slowly, it was the burning desire in me was growing, and I always loved people. I lo loved God. So ministry was my uh, place to be. I always felt deep in my heart. And then I suddenly decided I want to go to seminary to study. Uh, was never fond of the church, to be honest. Uh, it, was, it was always a little awkward for me because... <laughs> I don't know. It's probably because of my experience at the church where I've seen pastors be too like uptight. And I was not that person. So I, I said, you know, I probably will go teach somewhere, but not at the church. But four years in the seminary, God changed my heart. And I was like very passionate about church. But then I came from IT into ministry. I thought I'll fi figure this out somehow. But I just didn't. All I knew was that churches in India, at least the ones I've seen, not every church, was not being what it was called to be. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what was right. So I was like, I need to learn. So I applied to a lot of places, and one of the, you know, suddenly I landed at Saddleback Church. If you know that church, it's like uh, Rick Warren is the pastor there. It's like a huge mega church. I had no clue who Rick Warren was or how big the church was. Uh, I just did a Google search. That's the truth. Uh, and I, they said, OK, come on over. You look interesting. And you have an accent, too. Come on over. So I went there, and you know the learning was amazing. So five years at Saddleback, I used to call myself the temple elephant. You know, you live there, you stay there, you eat there, and everything. You know, you, so I was there for five years. And then again, I realized, you know, I need to put what I learned into practice, right? So I applied. 
again went to Google search uh, and uh, landed up in Ca uh, Canada, in BC, in a, in a church at Langley. Worked there for a year with young adults. And then, uh, I all, and then after a year, I got an opportunity to work with a church here in Surrey. That ended in November. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, let me, I need to find a different church to just go and worship and just be there not do much, right? So I just looking around, and one of my friends interestingly said, there's a church here, you should check it out. Uh, in no, and I think it's November or first week of December I was here, and people were so amazing and friendly. It was, yeah, I really, I felt so much at home, and you guys have been so, so kind. Thank you so much for, you know, taking me in, and, you know, I just feel so much at home. I work with churches. I used to work with the hospitality ministry, I know how you know uh, people feel sometimes disconnected because of the first thing you know uh, the first impression is the best impression like so here I am and you know seven months later Roger asked me he's been so kind he's one of my mentors I consider him one of my mentors spent time with him learning so much and he said why don't you come up and uh, you know sh share God's word sometime so thank you so much for the uh, opportunity and uh, the next thing I wanted to say is, you know, my communication is a little different. So uh, apart from the accent, there's all the, so sometimes I do this weird head wobble, right? Uh, so if I'm doing this, I'm not disagreeing. Uh, many people have thought that I'm just saying, okay. Uh, yeah, there's an interesting uh, story where I was with a friend from the U.S. I was in India. I've never been outside the country. I was in the U.S. He was there with me, standing on the road, and on the other side of the road was another friend of mine. His name was Sumesh. And you know how this traffic is crazy loud, right, in India? So you're like uh, this noise and chaos. And I called out his name, Sumesh. And he looked at me, and I did this. <laughs> and, then I, and then I started walking. My friend was like, what happened here? He said, no, I, I asked him where he's going. He said, he's going out. And I said, okay, I'm going out too, and I'll come back and see you in your room. <laughs> he was like... <sighs> and he said, okay, he kept walking. So if it was India, I could probably s preach a sermon like this. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, anyway, so... Uh, there could be some broad generalizations, and I just want you to understand it's from my experience. And I'm not speaking as an expert here. I'm just speaking as a person, another student, just understanding certain, uh, what do you call, difficulties and struggles we go through in Christian life, right? And uh, anyways, uh, I would love to read the passage with you guys. Uh, well, it's on the Sermon on the Mount, but uh, the Beatitudes... Uh, till verse 7. So, can you go back to the previous slide? Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach to them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Well, just to give you a context of the passage, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a very, very interesting pa passage. It's probably one of the most loud passages, passages, and probably the most, I think, and most influential, influential passage, Christians and non-Christians, you know, the country I come from was founded pretty much on this. Gandhi was a big, uh, what do you call, it, fan of this passage. He was a big fan of Christ. He wasn't a big fan of Christians, at least then. But uh, he was a big, big fan of Christ. And this was very, very central to him. And, uh, you know, even in the U.S., I think Martin Luther was a big fan of him. I mean, literally two countries formed their culture and change the way they see their neighbors and their fellow beings 
humanity itself based on this passage. So I always found this passage very, very powerful. Um, and the key thing to this passage is that if you go to uh, chapter f uh, 4 in verse 23 and onwards, it talks about how Jesus went through Galilee and he was teaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. This passage is pretty much a summary of Jesus' ministry and what he does in between in, on the Sermon on the Mount is basically he's drawing a picture of what the kingdom look li looks like. And then he goes on demonstrating what the kingdom looks like, you know. And so it's very important that the key thing to this passage is about living life in the kingdom. And in chapter 9, 35, it summarizes that ministry again, Jesus' ministry. So what Matthew is actually trying to tell us is, look guys, here's the summary. Here's what Jesus did. He's just painting and demonstrating and teaching about the kingdom of God. So when we read the Beatitudes, it pretty much portrays life in the kingdom. And at that time, I think it was very, very revolutionary for people to hear this because it was literally upside down. And also what amazed people, as we see in ch uh, chapter 720, is that people were like thinking, how is this guy so convincing in painting this picture? It should be he, he, he was there. And uh, the crowd was not only the disciples, but also the outsiders. So for me, the key words today, uh, as Roger has spoken on the other ones, is Bless, blessed are the merciful. Now, what's mercy? Mercy, we have lots of words attached to it, you know, pity, compassion, um, forgiveness, a lot of things. It's like we see mercy in a lot of different ways. But one of the key things is that mercy is basically love in action. There's a saying, you know, you, 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 you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Basically, mercy is getting us, our, ourselves into a place where we are getting into the messiness. It's, it's, it, mercy is not afraid to get its hands dirty. It's getting into a place where we are able to be with people wherever they are and helping them out. Uh, it's just not a, a feeling of, oh, I feel bad for this guy. It's really getting into what the person is going through and helping them out. That's mercy. It's love in action. If, if you just say, you know, if you just look at it, okay, I love this person, but uh, it, that's not mercy. That's what... Uh, the script uh, God talks about, uh, you know, the whole idea, the model of mercy is basically Jesus, right? And uh, it would have been good for God to sit there and say, you know what, it's, I really feel bad for these people. But he literally gave his son for us. And that's the key thing. For us as a church, being merciful is basically summed up in this one where it's basically love and action. See, forgiveness is about how you see things or how you see it. Mercy is about how you do it. Forgiveness is about how you see things, how you see that person. Uh, forgiveness is basically you saying, you know what, I'll let go, I'll forgive that person. But mercy is about how you do it. So the question is, why do we have to be merciful? I just want to... Uh, Make a note, I want you to make a note here. Showing mercy is very different from being merciful. So what I'm driving to is that in life in the kingdom is about being merciful, not only just showing mercy now and then. Uh, so why be merciful? One is because God was merciful to us. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 says, but God, who's rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We have to be merciful because, firstly, God was merciful to us. Our whole salvation story hinges on the fact that God acted and he showed us love through action. 
And uh, the next one is why, because God commands us to be merciful. You know, Ma Micah 6, 8 says, The Lord has told you what is good. This is what the Lord requires from you, to do what's right, to love mercy, and to live humbly with your God. And in, in Hosea 6, 8, 6 says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. This verse has been quoted by Christ almost tw twice to the Pharisees. What he's sa is saying is, what God requires from us is to be merciful. What God wants us to be and wants or commands us to do is be merciful. And the third thing is, God, because God because we would need mercy in the future. James 2.13 says, no mercy will be shown to those who show no mercy to others. In the f later, when, when we are standing in front of God, the one, uh, one of the things he's gonna look at us and say was, yes, Ben, you've been merciful. And he'll be merciful to me because I, if I sh have shown mercy to others. And also because like the verse, uh, Beatitude says, blessed are the merciful. Merciful brings us happiness. And lastly, it's one of the ways we express our faith. Mercy is a way we live out our faith. Mercy is a way we express our faith. You know, you could bring in stories after stories after stories of how people have been touched by other people people's, you know, uh, love and generosity and mercy. That's one of the biggest compelling f things about mercy is that it lives, it's, it's a visible evidence of somebody's faith. You know, uh, in James 1, 1.26 says, the purest, the highest form of religion is that uh, the religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. One of the key things for us in our highest form of worship, you know, it's great to have a great music, to sit here, to praise God. That's one of the ways we do. But the highest form of our expression of our worship and our faith is basically to be merciful to people around us. So. Uh, also, the question of, you know, when we talk about happiness, what it does it mean to be blessed? Blessed, you know, coming from a country like, you know, India, um, a lot, there's, a, there's a lot of things we attach to. You know, b being blessed is about a privilege that because we have done this, because we have stayed, uh, you know, above uh, a certain level of morality, that uh, we are blessed by people, I mean, by God. And that's not really what the passage is trying to say. When, when you talk about the Beatitudes, it's about an internal happiness. Have you ever gone and done something right, even though the situation around you was very compelling not to? Have you ever gone and done something right and felt good about it? Even though you were probably got you in trouble or something? That's the feeling. That's the feeling of being blessed. Blessed is not a sense of you know uh, feeling happy for you know in a very momentous way like just yeah I've done this I've done charity yes I'm good but being blessed is about living out and being able to live out your faith in in uh, being able to love indiscriminately being able to love without any barriers we struggle as a church you know not. I'm generalizing here, but many times, even personally, I've struggled and I've gone, gone back and said, why is it so hard to, be, to live out my faith there? Because we are not yet there, we are growing towards it. And being blessed is about that growing and becoming merciful, not just showing mercy. So that's what God has called us to. That's what life in the kingdom is basically living out your faith. Life in the kingdom is, 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 is being able to just be what God has called you to be without any inhibitions, without any struggles. That's what life in the kingdom is. Life in the kingdom is a growing life, okay? When you are in the kingdom, you're able to grow and you are able to live out your life as a merciful person. That's what life in the kingdom is. I want to talk about 
have, um, being merciful and growing in mercy in fellowship, okay? One of my mentors, like I served under Pastor Rick Warren, he always said this, in real fellowship, people experience mercy. Fellowship is a place of grace where mistakes aren't rubbed in, but rubbed out. Fellowship happens when mercy wins over justice. You can have fellowship without forgiveness because bitterness and resentment always destroy fellowship. Our place of fellowship is here on Sundays, and other days we gather to our, as a church. So what, this was powerful for me because what, in some ways, as, as you go on to read uh, uh, the rest of the passage, he's trying to say that this is where we could, this is a place where we are learning and growing up to be, uh, become a, becoming a merciful person. Outside of this fellowship, it's easy to, be, you know, be, show mercy now and then. But this is a place where we are able to grow as a body into becoming, into a state of bless, blessedness. You know, uh, that life in the kingdom in some way starts here. So, but we still struggle. I understand that. I struggle. I struggle when it comes to, you know, uh, showing mercy. I struggle when it comes to humility. A lot of things uh, about life in the kingdom itself. It's hard. But why? The question always is how, do, maybe people ask us, oh, how do I become merciful? But I, I think the right question for us is, when we see this as life in the kingdom, then if we are a body, we should be growing, right? I mean, how many of us has looked back and said, uh, how can I grow? I'm six foot three, I mean, I don't need to grow. And in that sense, but we, we just look at, our, we don't look at ourselves and say, how, how can I grow? We don't go searching for something to help us grow. We just eat, sleep, and do the things just, you know, without much thought. But then we are growing, right? I mean, when we get old, we stop growing, but we reproduce. That's growth as well. But uh, what I'm saying is, if as a body, as a, as a person, we have to constantly keep growing in spiritual maturity. That's our end goal. But if we, st we don't look back and say, how can I grow in spiritual maturity? No, but I think the right question for me, the way I see it is, not how can I grow into becoming a merciful person. The question I think we have to ask is, what's stopping me from growing, right? The time we actually look at ourselves and you know, so, you know, suddenly we stop growing, we'll ask the question, what's, what's wrong with me? What's stopping me from growing? And I think there are a few things that actually, in our lives, God has placed us in a beautiful place of growth. Everything is perfect. Maybe some things, our environment and our, our, our lifestyles, those are the things that actually stop us or stifle our growth. Uh, so the question is, what's, what are the things that stop us from growing? The first one is, I think, busyness, right? Uh, and uh, when I was working in uh, the software industry, it was like thir sometimes 13 hours. It's like uh, there, it's like you're, you're pretty much a slave, wage slave. And when you work there, you're so busy, caught up with your, so many things, and all, even after... Uh, you leave work, you're with friends, and you know, there's, there's so much we had add on to our lives. And then, you know, that busyness, I don't stop to think and see who needs help. The classic passage of that is, you know, the Good Samaritan story. You know, it's easy to kind of blame those two guys who walked away, right? Um, the Le priest and the Levite and the Samaritan had come in and helped. Um, that's the classic passage of, you know, their mercy is juxtaposed with love. The idea of love. Who's the person, if, you, if you're asking, who should be the person I'm merciful to, the question would automatically, who's your neighbor? But you see, I, I think in a lot of, you know, it could have been justified for the priest to say, you know what, oh, I have to go to the temple. I have to open the door so that, you know, the, the greeters and the volunteers come in and, you know, uh, you know, everything needs to be set before the whole worship thing starts. It could have been. Is that a valid reason for the priest to just leave the person and go? Maybe he was busy. 
Maybe he was busy. Maybe the Levite was busy as well. And it, it's easy in us, in a, in a, you know, many of the times, it's not that it, we don't want to be merciful, we don't know who to be merciful to. We can't see the needs around us, we can't see the piece, person lying on the road, I've done it. Uh, you know, you, you walk into my church, my church was like back at home, was classical example. Right outside the church, there'll be like beggars sitting. No one stops by, and even I haven't stopped by. These guys are really in need. We'll be planning to go to some mission somewhere. <laughs> that was the tragedy of this. Like, we'll be planning, okay, we need to go support, uh, uh, what, uh, another ch uh, church there, or uh, like a mission where, like, you go somewhere and you're, like, uh, handing out uh, tracks or you're uh, handing out food and all. Right in front of us, there were, there were people who were, who were, uh, looking for help and mercy. We, I just couldn't see it. It became part of my environment. In the busyness, I was walking and walking out, walking and walking out. I just didn't see it. You know, the first time I actually felt for a homeless person, I don't know why it hit me so hard. India, I mean, a lot of people are homeless, you know. But I've never felt so bad in my heart. It was in California right in Orange County, a guy was standing, I was driving with my friend, I, a guy was standing with the, like, you know, uh, help me or with a sign. I was, it sunk. I don't know why. I just don't know why. Maybe it was because I was, I had more time to look around me. Attention, paying attention to people is like an act of love. It is probably one of the highest forms of love. I mean, as, as parents, you know, that's the biggest thing you give to ki uh, your kids, right? As uh, wives and husbands, that's the number one thing you want from each other, probably. I mean, yes, there are other things, but it's like when you, s one of the biggest things I've uh, heard from people at, uh, here is like, you know what, I need your time and attention. That's that's probably the highest form of love that we, I mean we show to people, and when we show and you know, um, when we make time and we show and when we give our attention to people around us, that's probably one of the biggest things, and that's that's the high, one of the highest forms of mercy. We we might not have a, a lot of things to give to people, you know. I don't think there's, I mean, we can be everything to everyone, but. Giving our attention, listening to them, and you know, listening to the needs itself is a great form of you know, uh, uh, being you know, becoming that merciful, merciful person. So maybe you know, in our business, all we need to do is allocate some time. Maybe we can f look for people, or even through the church, you know, just where can I serve? Where can I be of help? You know, we had a Syrian refugee family. Uh, you know, we were helping them, you know, uh, you know, settle down here. Uh, I, I went to help too. It was great to see, you know, uh, it, it wasn't what we did. It was just being there and uh, just listening to them, just, you know, uh, maybe a few interactions here and there. Then I'm, I'm, I'm sure how much they val value that. And I've been on the receiving end in a lot of things, you know, coming to the U.S., you know, people used to just pick me up and drive me places, just for, even for groceries. That was amazing. It was a small thing, but it was great. And I'm, I, in, in some ways, that's kind of made a deep imprint in my heart. And mercy, you know, one thing about mercy is it doesn't stop with you. It will always moves on. It always moves on. And you know what? That person's life has changed. My life was changed. And I've been, you know, seeing how I can help other people. The other thing is also, I guess, this is a biggie for us, I guess. In some ways, we have an unconscious feeling of uh, spiritual superiority in some, you know, we could move into that, slowly cross the line and get into the place. And may, that could kill our, you know, efforts to become a merciful person. You, it, it says you can't look out for people when you're looking down on them, 
you can't look out for people when you're looking down on them. And having a sense of uh, spiritual superiority actually, you know, in many ways, narrows our. And in some ways, you know what, the only holy person in our eyes, I'm not saying we generally do that, but it would get to a place where the only spiritual person in our lives is ourselves. And nobody would fit our standards. And we will get into a place where we would say, there's no one I could go out and you know, help. You know, because sometimes we feel they deserve it. Uh, the classic case is the Orlando uh, shootings, you know, and, and uh, there was this church holding banners and, you know, and then uh, the good story is there's another church which kind of, they dressed up as angels and they kind of, you know, came and blocked these, uh, this church from holding out uh, banners, you know, saying, you know, uh, uh, th you know, about hell and because I think there was a sense of, you know, saying, you know, the, here's the line I draw. And even in the, um, in Jesus' times, there was this constantly this problem. We probably draw it very differently, but we, we sometimes have that line. Um, but mercy is not a, all about that. Mercy is actually getting in and getting ourselves dirty because that's what Christ did for us. In no sense of, you know, uh, I guess, if Christ had to look, if Christ had to draw the line, I don't know who to be. He'll be the only person in the circle, I guess. And sometimes we get into that place where we are actually drawing that circle. And it, you know, the, the, the biggest danger about that circle is it becomes narrower and narrower. People will slowly get out, and the only person left in that circle would be us. So... It's our posture of grace as a church when we go, and as people, uh, when we go to and, you know, hear people. I've been, uh, my story, there's a, there's a big story behind me, and, you know, Roger knows it, Garth knows it, and, you know, you know that was one of my saddest moments. But it was so hard because the posture everyone took around me, and uh, I've worked with the church, it, it was like, it was, I always felt pushed back, you know. I've always felt it when they were getting into a place of judging me and stuff like that. So, it's not a question. We should never get, when we are showing mercy, we should never get into a place of, you know, questioning. You know, the, the, the classic passage is 9-2 where uh, there's this blind man and, uh, you know, the guys are asking Jesus, uh, disciples, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Christ was brilliant. He said, that's not the question you should ask. What can happen now? How can God work in this place? Is the, is the question you should be asking. And every moment of when, we, when people are in need and you know, in need of mercy, that's the question we should be asking. Not about how it happened, what was wrong, was this this person's sin, or you know whose sin it was, or what were the? Uh, is he going through the consequences, or whatever that is different? The quest, the question we have to ask is, how can God's glory be revealed here? And one of the most powerful ways is that we have to take that posture of being merciful and move forward. So the next one, and I, I always feel coming from a context like India, this is like. Every time this this hits me hard is the question of identity. You know, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite, they probably built their identities based on who they were, how they were born, the class, the caste, or even their functionality, right? Uh, one of the key things I learned through the passage was the bottom line was love your neighbor as yourself. But here's the problem. Who you think you are will determine who will you will see as your neighbor. If you think you are, if, you, if, we, if we think ourselves to be spiritually superior to people, we will, only th we will only go and reach out to people who are up to that standard. Everyone who falls down, we, it's, it's not, we, we don't make a conscious decision in this. It's unconscious, I've done that. If I think I'm this, a class of a person, you know, 
all that, I would only be talking and reaching out to people who are like me in some sense. And you know, in a culture like India, like you know, we, we, there's language, there's culture, there's caste, so many lines drawn. The Samaritan is actually a person who's probably outside the you know, boundary, outside the walls. And that's why probably it was easier for him to reach out and see that person as a human being, right? And that's where we have to get to a place where we are looking at people as on a very basic level, saying, you know what, this is a person Christ, God made in my image. And in many ways, that's where I will stay. I'm not perfect. That's my, that's my ground on which I stand. So our identities play a big role in how we extend ourselves, you know, to reach out to people who are in need. So that's one thing. And how do you break this identity as a church is we have to slowly expand ourselves as a community, be it small groups or be it as a church. We slowly have to get people coming into and growing as a community, or we will only be an exclusive community and we will never see the needs around us outside. Yes, it's easy to kind of go and see a person in need and all that, but maybe that's not the line we draw. Maybe the line we draw is uh, being Christians, we have to stick to each other and actually have a close circle. And it's, it becomes harder for anyone to come in and it becomes harder. You know, maybe the need is not very physical. The need is very spiritual. We have to have our eyes open to the people who are lying by the wayside, not hurt physically, but spiritually hurt. Or not hurt uh, uh, physically, maybe emotionally hurt. Maybe mentally hurt. You know, all these things. We have to be embracing. And the only way we will grow as a person in mercy is by embracing and growing as a community. So maybe that's a call for us to, you know, slowly invite people into our church, invite people into our homes, invite people into our uh, small groups. So slowly and slowly our identity needs to kind of, you know, be, become more like Christ, you know, be, become more like the Samaritan. And the next one that actually stops us from being merciful is that... Uh, you know, in many ways, we are encumbered with our own needs that we don't see anything outside of it. We are too busy with ourselves. So, you know, ministry is not something we do. I mean, I, mean I, I think ministry, sometimes we see it as something we do in, with the excess of time and resource we have. That means, like, every of, all of our needs are taken care of, and then we, when we have extra time or resource, we say, oh, let me go and get involved with our church. That's not how we grow. In some ways, ministry is like tithing, right? Uh, we don't give 10% to God. Uh, God gives 90% to us. So in some ways, we automatically give 10% and we live in the 90%. Not that. We have 100% and we give 10%. Find ways to just get involved in, you know, maybe an hour a week or maybe 30 minutes a week. Uh, you would not believe how much you'll grow and suddenly you'll say, you know, you would, you would have committed for an hour from 30 minutes and then two hours. And then you are like slowly, you know, you're becoming more giving, content with your time, content with your resource. You don't, you don't grow and then commit. You grow through commitments. No matter how small it is, we go, grow through commitments. So maybe find ways to, you know, commit yourself. You know, the, the, the great thing about commitment is when you do commitment is about personal growth. It's not about how much you're giving. Uh, I used to raise funds for my uh, f friends, you know, who are in need. And, you know, sometimes, you know, my, some of my friends are in IT. They are doing well. They'll say, I'll write a check for $1,000. I said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Don't do that. Take the $1,000 and give me $100 every month for the next 10 months. It's harder for them to. And slowly they realize, suddenly they say, ah, oh, 100 is actually, I can do a lot more, and then they increase it. You just keep growing. But commit to something small, and then you'll grow. That's how you grow in mercy too, becoming merciful. And the last one is, and um, 
uh, this is uh, I keep I keep reminding myself about this. We, uh, in some ways, we have forgotten grace. Uh, we have forgotten actually our you know that our forgiveness that was re- given to us. You know, why is it so hard for us to forgive people, or why is it so hard for us to be merciful to others? If you realize that, you know, say you're, I'm standing in Savon or something in a line, you know, for the the bill, a counter, you know, and suddenly some I step on somebody's toes, and I say sorry. They say that's okay. I understand. That's okay. And I turn around, and somebody steps on my toe. What happens? My my inclination to say that's okay would be far greater. But say it happened a year back, and somebody steps on my toes. I've stepped on somebody's toes a year back, and now somebody's. St- my propensity or inclination to be angry is more. I sometimes might show my anger and like, you know, that's because what's happened is way, past, way in the past. It's not in the recent memory. And for us to forgive and be merciful, sometimes we think God has been merciful in the past. But we have to realize that every day, God is forgiving us. God is being merciful to us. So I would say, find ways to, you know, share your own uh, ways, or at least once a day, share with someone how God has been good to you or merciful to you. That keeps us constantly, uh, reminds ourselves that we are being forgiven every day. It's easy to say, you know what, um, it's easy to forget what God has done in the past. But actually, it's, it's a recurring thing. Um, God is literally pulling us out of the tomb every single day. And we keep going back, you know. So I would say busyness, our spiritual uh, superiority, our uh, uh, identity, our self-interest, uh, more focused on self-interest, and that we have forgotten grace. These are things that probably stifle us. We are naturally, God has put us in a place to be merciful. The only reason we are not probably struggling with all this is because these are things that come and stifle us from being merciful. Well, the, the thing I want to sh- leave with is that, you know, we are in the kingdom in some ways, you know, and we have to be growing. And we have to start living life in the kingdom. The greatest frustration in life is not about, the greatest freedom in life is not when people, you know, you you can be in prison, not the ideal situation, but still. But you could still be free if you are able to do what you love to do freely, right? As people, as uh, as the body of Christ, we love to be loving, we love to be merciful, we love to be giving, we love to be humble. And that's what we have to be, able to freely express ourselves and live out our lives. But if we are always encumbered with small things in life, it's, those are things that actually pull us back from living life in the kingdom. You know, that's what Christ had said is, if you want to be blessed, if you want to be happy, uh, live your life freely. These are the ways. And one of the ways as a spiritual capacity is to be merciful. And I would love for all of us to kind of get and get growing, you know. A merci- being merciful is not a one-time act. It's about a growth. And uh, I'm sure with our community and with God's, uh, you know, blessing, and we would get there. It's just that we have to find ways to get out all these small things and leave these things out to, for us to grow well. So, thank you. I would love, love to close in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this wonderful uh, opportunity to share your word. And Father, uh, so much we forget that you've given us the, uh, the keys, Lord, to living life in your kingdom and actually just walking in and being ourselves and uh, being... Uh, what you have called us to be. Uh, but somehow, Lord, things have come that have uh, stifled us from living out a life you have called us to live, Lord. Father, help us to consciously make efforts, maybe small steps, 
get into a place where we are able to, Lord, freely uh, live out our faith and, uh, Father, be an incredible witness and a channel of your love to the people around us. Thank you once again for uh, everything you're doing through us, Lord, and uh, in your son's precious name I pray. Amen.